Today, we are going to break down distributed file servers, how they work, why we distribute storage, and how we can optimize them for performance and fault tolerance. We'll start with a simple single server design and gradually evolve into a fully distributed architecture that scales across multiple data centers. So let's get started. At its core, a file server is a computer that stores and manages files, making them available to clients over a network. Imagine you have a shared folder on your office computer. Anyone on the same network can open, modify, or save files in that folder. That's essentially what a file server does, but at a much larger scale. So let's say you have a company with 100 employees and they all need access to shared documents. So you set up a file server where everyone can store and retrieve files. This works well until too many people start accessing it all at the same time or the storage capacity fills up. Then performance slows down and eventually the system fails. So when one server isn't enough, we distribute storage across multiple servers. And this allows us to increase capacity by adding more machines, improving performance by balancing load, and enhancing fault tolerance by ensuring that if one server fails, others can take over. So let's say we now have three file servers instead of one. Server one stores documents and spreadsheets. Server two stores images and videos. And server three stores backups and logs. Now when user requests files, we route them to the right server based on the file type. And this is already a basic distributed file system. But there is a problem. What happens if server 2 goes offline? All the images and videos stored there becomes inaccessible. And that's where replication comes in. So instead of storing files on just one server, we make copies and store them on multiple servers. This ensures that if one server fails, we can still retrieve the files from another. In a simple case of replication, server 1 is the primary server to store documents and server 3 has a backup copy. Server 2 is the primary to store images or videos, and server 1 has a backup copy. And likewise, server 3 is the primary to store logs, whereas server 2 has a backup copy. Now, even if one server crashes, data is still available. But this setup increases storage cost since we are storing multiple full copies of each file. A better approach here is erasure coding. And if you haven't, Check out my video on erasure coding where I explain it with simple code examples and its benefits over replication. However, choosing replication or erasure coding depends on your system's fault tolerance strategy. Let's understand this at a high level here. So in case of replication based recovery, if the file chunks are replicated, for example, you stored on multiple file servers, the system simply fetches the missing chunk from another replica. So if a server A fails and was storing chunk 3, but server B also has a copy, the system retrieves chunk 3 from server B instead. Now, if the system uses erasure coding instead of full replication, it reconstructs the missing chunk using the remaining data and parity chunks. For example, in a 4 comma 2 erasure coding scheme, that is 4 data chunks and 2 parity chunks, if one or two server fails, the system rebuilds the lost chunk using the parity chunks and serves the reconstructed file to the user. Again guys, I highly encourage you to go back and check my video on erasure coding. Let's continue here. There is still one more thing we need to figure out. How does the system know where to retrieve the missing chunk from? And that is where comes the metadata store. It keeps track of which servers store which file chunks. So if a request comes in and a file server is down, the metadata service dynamically reroutes the request to another server that holds a copy or can reconstruct the missing data. If a server failure is detected, a background recovery process may automatically replicate or reconstruct the lost chunks on a new healthy server. Now that we have multiple servers, we need a smart way to distribute files across them so that no single server gets overloaded and large files don't slow down retrieval speeds. And this is where chunking and load balancing come in. In chunking, instead of storing 100 MB of video file on a single server, we split it into smaller 10 MB chunks. So chunk one may be in server A, chunk two in server B, chunk three in server C, and so on and so forth. Now. When a user downloads the file, they can retrieve chunks in parallel, making it much faster. If one server fails, we only need to fetch the missing chunk rather than losing the entire file. As our system grows, we might need to store data in multiple regions to reduce latency and comply with data residency loss. This means setting up file server across different data centers around the world. 
So users from the US are directed to file servers in the US and users from Europe are directed to file servers in the EU region. And cross-region replication ensures that files exist in multiple locations for disaster recovery. Cloud providers like AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, and Azure Blob Storage all use this approach to deliver high-speed, low-latency storage access worldwide. Now that we understand how a distributed file system stores and retrieves data, let's talk about consistency models, one of the most important trade-offs engineers face when designing scalable storage systems. Consistency defines how soon updates made to a file or object become visible across the system. If multiple users or applications are accessing a file at the same time, we need to decide, should they always see the latest version immediately? Or can we allow some temporary inconsistencies in exchange for better performance and availability? These trade-offs lead us to the two major consistency models, strong consistency and eventual consistency. In a strong consistent system, Every read operation always returns the most recent write. This means that as soon as a file is updated, all users, no matter where they are, see the latest version instantly. For example, imagine a banking system where you transfer money. You wouldn't want to check your balance and still see the old amount after the transfer. Strong consistency ensures that once your transaction is complete, your updated balance is immediately visible across all systems. However, this model slows down writes because the system has to confirm that all replicas have been updated before allowing new reads. It also makes scaling more challenging, especially across multiple data centers. In the eventual consistency model, when you update a file, not all servers immediately reflect the change. Instead, updates are propagated gradually, meaning that for a short period, some users might see the old version, while others see the updated one. A great example of this is cloud storage. If you upload a new version of a document to an S3-like storage, you might briefly see the older version from another region before the update fully propagates. However, after a few seconds or minutes, all users will eventually see the latest data. It allows faster writes because changes don't have to be synchronized across all servers immediately. It also enables better scalability since different storage nodes can process requests independently. And here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the key differences. Please take a moment to pause and check it out. Now, most modern storage systems don't strictly follow one consistency model. Instead, they allow developers to choose from different level of consistency based on their needs. For example, Amazon S3 follows mixed consistency model. New objects are immediately visible. However, updates and deletes may take some time to propagate. Similarly, Databases like Cassandra and DynamoDB allow you to tune the consistency level per operation, letting you decide whether to prioritize accuracy or speed. Finally, let's talk about some optimization strategies. Because as we scale our storage system, we need optimizations to keep it fast, efficient, and cost-effective. And here are four key techniques. Starting with local caching, you store frequently accessed files in high-speed SSDs or in-memory caches. It reduces load on your main file servers. For example, a frequently accessed video file is stored in cache so users don't have to fetch it from disk every time. You can also think of tiered storage. Hot data, which is the frequently accessed files, can be stored on fast NVM SSDs. Cold data or rarely accessed files is stored on hard disk drives or even tapes. For example, old backups are moved to low-cost archival storage after 30 days. You should also consider using erasure coding. So instead of full replication, we use parity chunks to reconstruct lost data while using less storage. And finally, you can think of having a cluster manager which dynamically assigns new files to the least busy file server. It prevents bottlenecks and ensures even distribution of storage and request. For example, if server A reaches 90% capacity, new files are automatically stored on server B instead. A file server is much more than just a place to store data. If you want to master file servers, start by experimenting with different file systems caching strategies, and fault-tolerant architectures. I hope this breakdown helps you understand how file servers are distributed, optimized, and scaled in real-world systems. Thank you for watching, and as always, happy learning.